I remember how, that night, I lay awake in the wagon lit in a tender, delicious ecstasy of excitement. My burning cheek pressed against the impeccable linen of the pillow and the pounding of my heart mimicking that of the great piston ceaselessly thrusting the train that bore me through the night, away from Paris, away from girlhood, away from the white, enclosed quietude of my mother's apartment, into the unguessable country of marriage. And I remember, I tenderly imagined how, at this very moment, my mother would be moving slowly about the narrow bedroom I had left behind forever, folding up and putting away all my little relics, the tumbled garments that I would not need any more, the scores for which there had been no room in my trunks, the concert programmes I'd abandoned. She would linger over this torn ribbon and that faded photograph, with all the half-joyous, half-sorrowful emotions of a woman on her daughter's wedding day. And in the midst of my bridal triumph, I felt a pang of loss as if, when he put the gold band on my finger, I had in some way ceased to be the child in becoming his wife. Are you sure, she'd said when they delivered the gigantic box that held the wedding dress he'd bought me, wrapped up in tissue paper and red ribbon like a Christmas gift of crystallised fruit. Are you sure you love him? There was a dress for her too. Black silk with a dull prismatic sheen of oil and water, finer than anything she'd worn since the adventurous girlhood in into China, daughter of a rich tea planter. My eagle featured, indomitable, indomitable mother. What other student at the conservatoire could boast that her mother had outfaced the junk full of Chinese pirates, nursed the village through a visitation of the plague, shot a man eating tiger with her own hand, and all before she was as old as I? Are you sure you love him? I'm sure I want to marry him, I said, and would say no more. She sighed, as if it was with reluctance that she might at last banish the spectre of poverty from its poverty from its habitual place at our meagre table. For my mother herself had gladly, scandalously, defiantly beggared herself for love. And one fine day her gallant soldier never returned from the wars, leaving his wife and child a legacy of tears that never quite dried a cigar box full of medals and the antiques of the service revolver that my mother, grown magnificently eccentric in hardship, always kept in her reticule. In case, how I teased her, she was surprised by footpads on her way home from the grocer's shop. Now and then a starburst of light spattered the drawn blinds, as if the railway company had lit up all the stations through which we passed in celebration of the bride. My satin nightdress had just been shaken from its wrappings. It had slipped over my young girl's pointed breasts and shoulders, supple as a garment of heavy water, and now, teasingly, caressed me, egregious, insinuating, nudging between my thighs as I shifted restlessly in my narrow berth. His kiss, his kiss with tongue and teeth in it and a rasp of beard had hinted to me, though with the same exquisite tact as this nightdress had given, he'd given me of the wedding night, which would be voluptuously deferred until we lay in his great ancestral bed in the sea-girt, pinnacled domain that lay still beneath the grasp of my imagination. That magic place, the fairy castle whose walls were made of foam, that legendary habitation in which he had been born, to which one day I might bear an heir, our destiny, my destiny. Above the syncopated roar of the train I could hear his even, steady breathing. Only the communicating door kept me from my husband and it stood open. If I rose up on my elbow, I could see the dark, leonine shape of his head, and my nostrils caught a whiff of the opulent male scent of leather and spices that always accompanied him, and sometimes during his courtship had been the only hint he gave me that he had come into my mother's sitting room. For, though he was a big man, he moved as softly, as if all his shoes had soles of velvet, as if his footfall turned the carpet into snow. He had loved to surprise me in my abstracted solitude at the piano. He would tell them not to announce him, then soundlessly open the door, and softly creep up behind me with his bouquet of hothouse flowers, or his box of marron glacé, lay his offering upon the keys, and clasp his hands over my eyes as I was lost in a Debussy prelude. But the perfume of spiced leather always betrayed him. 
After my first shock, I was forced always to mimic surprise, so that he would not be disappointed. He was older than I. He was much older than I. There were streaks of pure silver in his dark mane, but his strange, heavy, almost waxen face was not lined by experience. Rather, experience seemed to have washed it perfectly smooth, like a stone on a beach whose fissures had been eroded by successive tides. And sometimes that face, in stillness when he listened to me playing, with the heavy eyelids folded over eyes that always disturbed me by their absence of light, seemed to me like a mask. As if his real face, the face that truly reflected all the life he had led in the world before he met me, before even I was born, as though that face might lay underneath the mask, or else elsewhere, as though he had laid by the, laid by the face in which he had lived for so long, in order to offer my youth a face unsigned by the years. And elsewhere I might see him playing. Elsewhere, but where? In, perhaps, that castle to which the train now took us, that marvellous castle in which he had been born. Even when he asked me to marry him, and I said yes, he still did not lose that heavy, fleshy composure of his. I know it must seem a curious analogy, a man with a flower, but sometimes he seemed to me like a lily. Yes, a lily, possessed of that strange, ominous calm of a sentient vegetable, like one of those cobra-headed fun funereal lilies whose white sheaths are curled out of a flesh as thick and tensely yielding as the touch of vellum. When I said that I would marry him, not one muscle in his face stirred, but he let out a long, extinguished sigh. I thought, oh, how he must want me and it was as though the imponderable weight of his desire was a force I might not withstand, not by virtue of its violence, but because of its very gravity. He had the ring ready in a leather box lined with crimson velvet, a fire opal the size of a pigeon's egg set in a complicated circle of dark antique gold. My old nurse, who still lived with my mother and me, squinted at this ring askance. Opals are bad luck, she said. But this opal had been his own mother's ring, and his grandmother's, and his mother's before that, given to an ancestor by Catherine de' Medici. Every bride that came to the castle wore it, time out of mind. And did he give it to his other wives and have it back from them? asked the old woman rudely. Yet she was a snob. She hid her incredulous joy at my marital coup, her little marquise, behind a facade of fault finding. But here, she touched me. I shrugged and turned my back pettishly on her. I did not want to be reminded how he had loved other women before me, but the knowledge often teased me in the threadbare self-confidence of the small hours. I was seventeen and knew nothing of the world. My Marquis had been married before, more than once, and I remained a little bemused that, after those others, he should now have chosen me. Indeed, was he still not mourning for his last wife? Tisk tisk went my old nurse, and even my mother had been reluctant to see her girl whisked off by a man so recently bereaved. A Romanian countess, a lady of high fashion, dead just three short months before I met him, a boating accident at his home in Brittany. They never found her body, but I rummaged through her back through the back copies of the society magazine that my old nanny kept in a trunk under her bed and tracked down her photograph sharp muzzle of a pretty, witty, naughty monkey, such potent and bizarre charm, of a dark, bright, yet wild, yet worldly thing whose natural habitat must have been some luxurious interior decorator's jungle, filled with potted plants and tame, squawking parakeets. Before that, her face is common property. Everyone painted her, but the read on engraving I liked best. The evening star walking on the rim of night. To see her skeletal, enigmatic grace, you would never think she had been a barmaid in a cafe at Montmartre until Puvi de Chavannes saw her and had her expose her flat breasts and elongated thighs to his brush. And yet it was the absence that doomed her, or so they said. The first of all his ladies, that sumptuous diva, I had heard her sing, is sold precociously musical child that I was, taken to the opera for a birthday treat. My first opera, I had heard her sing Isolde. With what 
white hot passion had she burned from the stage, so that you could tell she would die young. We sat high up, halfway to heaven in the gods, yet she half blinded me, and my father, still alive, oh so long ago, took hold of my sticky little hand to comfort me in the last act, yet all I heard was the glory of her voice. Married three times within my own brief lifetime, to three different graces, now, as if to demonstrate the eclecticism of his sake, he had invited me to join this gallery of beautiful women. I, the poor widow's child with my mouse-coloured hair that still bore the kinks of the plaits from which it had, it had so recently been freed, my bony hips, my nervous pianist's fingers. He was rich as Creosus. The night before our wedding, a simple affair at the Marie, because his countess was so recently gone, he took me and my mother, curious coincidence, to see Tristan. And do you know, my heart and swell, my heart swelled and ached so during the Liebestod that I thought I must truly love him. Yes, I did. On his arm, all eyes were upon me. The whispering crowd in the foyer parted like the Red Sea to let us through. My skin crisped at his touch. How my circumstances had changed since the first time I heard those voluptuous chords that carry such a charge of deathly passion in them. Now, we sat in a loge, in red velvet armchairs, and a braided, bewigged flunky brought us a silver bucket of iced champagne in the interval. The froth spilled over the rim of my glass and drenched my hands. I thought, my cup runneth over. And I had on a Poiret dress. He had prevailed upon my reluctant mother to let him buy my trousseau. What would I have gone to him in otherwise? Twice darned underwear, faded gingham, serge skirts, hand-me-downs. So, the opera, I wore a sinuous shift of white muslin, tied with silk string under the breasts, and everyone stared at me, at his wedding gift. His wedding gift, clasped around my throat, a choker of ruby, two inches wide, like an extraordinarily precious slip throat. After the terror, in the early days of the directory, the aristos who escaped the guillotine had an ironic fad of tying a red ribbon round their necks at just the point where the blade would have sliced through it, a red ribbon with a memory like a wound, and his grandmother, taken with the notion, had her ribbon made up in rubies, such a gesture of luxurious defiance. That night at the opera comes back to me even now, the white dress, the frail child within it, and the flashing crimson, crimson jewels around her throat, bright as arterial blood. I saw him watching me in the gilded mirrors, with the assessing eye of a connoisseur expecting horse flesh, or even of a housewife in the market, inspecting cuts on the slab. I had never seen, or else had never acknowledged, that regard of his before, the sheer carnal avarice of it and it was strangely magnified by the monocle lodged in his left eye. When I saw him look at me with lust, I dropped my eyes, but, in glancing away from him, I caught a sight of myself in the mirror, and I saw myself, suddenly, as he saw me, my pale face, the way the muscles in my neck stuck out like thin wire. I saw how much that cruel necklace, necklace became me, and, for the first time in my innocent and confined life, I sensed in myself a potentiality for corruption that took my breath away. The next day, we were married. Wow. 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 Wow.